Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening. My name is Nell Pepper. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I am so pleased to introduce this virtual event with Carl Dyseroth presenting his new book, Projections, A Story of Human Emotions in Conversation with Catherine Dulac. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. Tonight's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talks series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. To learn more about our other upcoming virtual events, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter or check out the page harvard.com backslash science for more info. I'll also be posting a link in the chat to our Science Research Public Lectures YouTube channel where you can view previous talks you might have missed. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button on your screen and we will get through as many as time allows. This event will have closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom that you're using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. In the chat, I will be posting a link to purchase copies of projections at harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this event series of and of our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore in Harvard Square. So we thank you so much for showing your support by tuning in both in support of our authors and of the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. Of course, we hope they don't, but if they do, we will do our best to resolve them quickly. I thank you so much for your patience and understanding. And now I am delighted to introduce our speakers. Carl Dyseroth is a professor of bioengineering and psychiatry at Stanford University and investigator at Howard Hughes Medical Institute. The winner of the Kyoto Prize and the Heineken Prize, he teaches and directs Stanford's undergraduate degree in bioengineering and treats patients with mood disorders and autism. Catherine Dulac is the Higgins Professor of Molecular and Cellular Biology, the Lee and Espoleta Professor of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University, and investigator at Howard Hughes Medical Institute. They will be discussing Carl Dyseroth's new book, Projections, a, his a Story of Human Emotions. Professor Dyseroth has spent his life pursuing truths about the human mind, both as a renowned clinical psychiatrist and as a researcher, creating and developing the revolutionary field of optogenetics, which uses light to help decipher the brain's workings. Through cutting edge research and gripping case studies from his patients, Projections tells a larger story about the material origins of human emotion, bridging the gap between the ancient circuits of our brain and the poignant moments of suffering in our daily lives. Nature praised the book as a scintillating and moving analysis of the human brain and emotions and a great read. I'm very pleased to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Carl and Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Carl, it's really a delight to be discussing this book with you. Um, just uh, to, um, uh, to put this into the context, how I heard about your book. Um, first, I know you as a, as a colleague, as a neuroscientist, as uh, somebody who really has revolutionized the field of neuroscience. And we'll talk a little bit about this later. Um, but we meet occasionally a couple of times a year at meetings, and we talk about the brain, about circuitry, about uh, behavior. Behavior. And uh, in one of these Zoom uh, meetings that uh, we had, uh, we both start to discuss uh, our love for literature and, and reading and poetry. And you told me that you were just finishing writing a book. And so obviously I want to read it. And so you were kind enough to send me an early copy of your book. And I just love the book. I, I, and uh, it, it, there's so much richness. Um, it's so interesting, it's beautifully written, and as I understand, uh, you've really been thinking about writing a book for a long time, and you thought a lot about the format also of the book. So why don't you tell us about, uh, about your book? How did this come about? Uh, who is your audience? What is the message you want to convey? 
Well, uh, first of all, Catherine, thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's, it's really great to connect with you uh, this way. I've enjoyed our stimulating conversation. I've always known that you were uh, a kindred soul in, in appreciating the, the arts as well as the, the science. And so thank you for taking the time to do this. It really brings back uh, memories um, just uh, from my earlier time at Harvard, just to hear the word Harvard Square mentioned and to remember the times I spent wandering around there. And, and to, to also just to see you at, uh, and, and to connect with you again, it's, it's very meaningful. So thank you for, for taking the time. And, and I'll tell you the book, uh, it was something that, um, you know, I'd always loved, uh, as you have, I always loved literature and writing and the power of words to stir emotion. And I've marveled at that, wondered about it. It's been part of my whole life growing up and into uh, uh, adulthood and through clinical practice and through the progress of science, um, always returning to literature. But I'd always thought that it would be very hard to share with the broad public the essence of what we do, neuroscientists. It's, it's a, a challenge even to convey what we do to, to many scientists. And so that was, to, to answer your question, the first the first challenge was if I want to share some of the excitement and of the science, if I want to share some of the important experiences uh, uh, from the clinic, and if I want to help everybody understand this better, this moment in time and the, our progress uh, toward understanding of ourselves, it's going to be very challenging to figure out how to do it. What is the right voice? What is the right style? Uh, do, do you try to communicate with everybody um, by taking the, the, the mantle of an academic or the, 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 the white coat of a, of a scientist or just a person who, who loves the, the, the sound of words and, and sentences and, and the, the rhythm and, and music of language. And in the end, I decided uh, I couldn't choose among those. And so I just did it all together. And that's, <laughs> so that's what the book is. It's a, it's a, a mix of, of, of science and medicine and a, and a love of, of language. And, um, and I, I, I know that's strange, uh, but it was the only thing I could think of, of the only way I could, I could see going forward. And in the end, to answer your question, it's a book uh, I hope for everybody. So, so this is very interesting because in your book, you mentioned that you're bringing three independent perspectives, which actually correspond also to three aspects of your personality. One is psychiatry, so you as an MD. Uh, the other one is uh, imagination. And the third one is technology or, or science. And so let's start by psychiatry. I found this quite interesting because at the beginning of your book, um, uh, first, uh, you say the bewildering intensity of of emergency psychiatry provides a context for all the stories in this book. And indeed, there's something just very poignant about uh, the, um, the experience you described, uh, both you as a physician uh, and also of the patients. And even in one story, uh, the story is told from the perspective of a patient, not, not from the perspective of, a, of the physician. But what brought you to psychiatry? Because again, you know, at the beginning of your book, you say psychiatry was the least specialty I would have selected. And even I had experienced the field of psychiatry as unsettling. And by contrast, you say my early experience with neurosurgery had been invigorating. So how did you come about to select being a psychiatrist? Well, I, it surprised me uh, as much as, as anybody. I, uh, I had the greatest respect for, for uh, people from uh, psychiatry, but I didn't understand it as a specialty because it's the challenges they face are so different from other fields of, of medicine the there are no real measurables in, in psychiatry there are no real blood draws that that tell you which mental illness the person is suffering from the brain scans don't tell you that and it's all words even our our you know we we make diagnoses and track uh, responses to treatment with rating scales, but those are all words too. It's all it's all words, and it has to be uh, done artfully and scientifically. But it's very different in in that sense from from all the other branches of medicine. And 
I was completely uh, reset in a, in a single moment. I was a medical student doing a required psychiatry rotation. So medical students toward the end, as you know, of the end, at the end of their uh, uh, MD training, uh, go through a number of uh, rotations, they're called, their experiences, exposures to different branches of medicine. And psychiatry was required. I had done neurosurgery. I loved it. It was just a fantastic uh, uh, setting and, and, and everything about it was, was invigorating. But psychiatry, you talk about uh, experiences that are transformative. I was early, you know, the, the very first day I was on the psychiatry ward, a, a patient uh, burst into the room where I was, was sitting and I saw a human being uh, in front of me who was physically intact in every way, uh, no, no, nothing uh, altered physically. But I saw in an instant through what he was saying, through what he was yelling at me, honestly, uh, I saw how radically different his reality was from mine. And for somebody who had wondered about the construction of reality, that was interesting. But then his words were also so interesting, too. He was creating emotion, it, not, not to not not to, to sugarcoat his, his suffering it was a he was suffering from a very serious disorder called schizoaffective disorder but the nature of his word use was so creative and unusual uh that that as somebody who who was always intrigued by words i was also struck by that as well and and he was you know he had a complex uh delusion uh that uh, became uh, clear but what changed my whole life in that moment was realizing that this was uh, something totally understood so that the need was greatest uh, uh, compared to any other field of medicine in terms of how far we had to go. So I knew the need was great, the suffering was enormous, and then it was, wow, was it fascinating. It was so interesting. And I almost, it was almost a little guilty how interesting it was, right, because there's the, the suffering at the same time. And But to feel all those together and to realize that that this is that for someone who cares about words and language, and this is the only route in, and this is what matters, and this is how it's expressed and how it's treated, uh, at least in large part, that moment uh, reset me, and I became <laughs> effectively a psychiatrist in that moment. Um, so yeah, that that was it's 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 good to be open to experiences and to not uh, prejudge things before you experience them directly. Yeah, well, I always tell my students to get out of their comfort zone. So I think that uh, <laughs> that that's a, a, a nice example of that. And so, but what you say really brings a very uh, natural link to uh, your your second perspective, which is imagination. And again, citing your book, you say experience has revealed. Uh, the many limitations of modern neuroscience and psychiatry and ideas from literature have long seemed to me as important for understanding patients. Uh, I still value literature as much as science in thinking about the mind. So can you uh, go over this again? And, and also just to, um, uh, to put this also in, in your personal context, I understand as a child, you were an avid reader, uh, you were reading for hours to your dad. And uh, even you mentioned about going to and from school uh, with a book uh, perilously held uh, on the handbar, handlebar of your bike. And, you know, we're thinking that seems pretty dangerous. You know, we complain about people who read their, um, their email on their iPhone when they walk, but that, that is uh, pretty extreme. <laughs> it was extreme. And I, I did twice collide with parked cars, fortunately parked cars, but I, I, there's, there's nothing quite as shocking as being absorbed in a book and suddenly find yourself flying through the air and, and, and landing on the pavement. But I, it happened more than once, and so I, I was a slow learner. But the, 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 the interesting thing about the imagination side and, and how science and even medicine alone are not enough, I think, particularly when thinking about the brain, comes from, uh, there's really a modern perspective that can help make this, this clear. But I'll, I'll, I'll just you know, begin by saying, as a psychiatrist who carries out interviews uh, using words and using words to bring out what is within and trying to do that uh, artfully, you can't do it crudely. Uh, you have to elicit uh, what are often uh, guarded or hidden or even poorly understood uh, inner experiences from the patient. 
So you have to elicit these in a careful and respectful and slow way uh, very often. And it's almost like you're, you're doing uh, something with words that could never be done with, uh, at least with how we, the current uh, uh, abilities we have could not be done with a microscope, could not be done certainly with a, a, a scalpel, could not be done even with an electrode, even with modern uh, uh, recording electrodes and, and imaging methods, that the words are more precise at getting to something very important going on than any other, um, than any other method that we have uh, available to us. And so that's part of it, how important the, the words are. But then when we think about the imaginative experiences that people have and what gets reflected in poems and reflected in literature, and we realize how these stir us and affect our emotions so directly and powerfully, even separate from meaning, even separate from the, you know, the dictionary definition of words or the usual construction of sentences, words put together in a new way can, can make us feel things very deeply and, and powerfully. Realizing what's going on there is something like what we would say in neuroscience today is a, is a projection from a multidimensional space into uh, something that is uh, accessible and, and, and interpretable uh, uh, to the human conscious mind. When we feel an emotion, it's turning something very complex in the brain into something that we can understand. It's projecting all that complexity down into something that is unitary and, and tractable. And so realizing that and realizing what literature does and what poetry does in making us feel these things that are precise in the sense of being repeatable and powerful and, and describable, that's pretty important when you think about understanding the brain. That's accessing something that currently science and medicine cannot uh, reflect. And so in the book, what I try to do is, is certainly you know, present the, the science side and the medicine side, but also in, in each, each chapter, each story about these human beings is to use words to, to reflect uh, that inner state and to help people imagine, help people's uh, minds work to, to create that state within themselves. And so that's, that was the hope and the goal to, to, to bring that uh, uh, side together with the science and medicine. So I think you're, you're succeeding quite well in the book, but you also bring this third dimension, which is neuroscience. And uh, you explain how you've been uh, fascinated as, as a student by biology and, and, and the ability to go from uh, some more mechanistic molecular and cellular insight to try to understand what's happening up to uh, the organism. And so uh, why don't you Tell us a little bit about your, your development of this uh, technology optogenetics that really has revolutionized neuroscience by being able to access causality. So this was a, this became a, a theme of the book as I was writing. Of course, there, there's a lot that's exciting in neuroscience, a lot that's exciting in biology. Uh, um, and and I, I try to reflect the excitement of these other uh, technologies, other developments as well. But because aspects of the book are, are shared experiences of, of my own as well, optogenetics does show up a lot in the book. And it, it is important too, because it, it does allow us to move beyond uh, correlation uh, to study real-time causation, real-time causality in, in the mind. And so that became an important part. And so optogenetics, I know we have a broad audience here, uh, but it's something that is pretty easy to understand uh, conceptually. It's a, a way of thinking about using light in a way that's opposite to how we normally think about it. Normally we think about using light to observe. We bring in information into our eyes using light. But uh, as, as you certainly know, Catherine, optogenetics is the, is the, is the opposite of that. We're sending light into a system to change things, to make things happen. And to do that in a very precise way, to turn individual neurons or kinds of neurons, brain cells, on or off in real time during complex behaviors, during complex sensations or cognitions or actions. And by doing so, we can see what really matters, which cells matter, which cells can give rise to these complex uh, states and processes, and which, when altered, uh, uh, subvert the normal uh, function. And this works, uh, as you know, through a process of bringing uh, ancient 
forms of single-celled life and ancient uh, genes that were used by microbes and still are used by microbes to turn light into energy and information. We take those genes that work with natural light and we bring them to the mammalian brain. And there are single proteins called uh, microbial opsins that turn light into ion flow, into the electrical movement of ions across the surface membrane of cells. And the microbes do that for their own reasons. They need to turn light into energy and information. But that movement of ions, as you know, happens to be the neural code for on or off. If we have positive or negative ions going across the membrane, that ends up turning neurons on or off. And so by using genetic tricks to put these genes into single kinds of cells, or even single cells and guiding light to those kinds of cells or single kinds of cells or projections across the brain, we can actually uh, cause those cells to be turned on or off during real uh, time behavior and understand what matters uh, for the behavior. So that, that's optogenetics and it turns out to give us a, a new perspective uh, on how uh, the parts of the brain give rise to the beauty and the mystery of the, the, the whole uh, uh, system working together. So why so don't you give us a specific example? You know, that you have, I mean, every, each of you, the chapter deal with a particular patient, a particular mental illness or, 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 or more, and how um, you're informed by experiments, some of them being your own experiments. And so um, in, in the chapter, Caring Capacity, you talk about particular defects that are close to my heart that are related to uh, social interaction. Um, you talk about two opposite uh, uh, behavior, uh, Aynor who is hypersocial and Charles who is hypersocial. Tell us about these two patients, how you interacted with them, and then the thoughts and experiments you had uh, in your own lab and how, although this is done in mice, that my really um, uh, inspire you in, in your uh, procedure of medicine? Yeah, what was so exciting was, was as all this science was being developed and as the, we were gaining, not only developing the optogenetics technology, but also gaining insights into uh, how these behaviors work in the mammalian brain. At the same time, I was seeing patients in my clinic. In fact, this is my this is my little uh, clinic office here where I come and see patients. Um, and I see patients, I specialize in both depression and autism spectrum uh, disorders. And so I would have patients who, uh, who, these are both very, these are difficult conditions to treat and often don't respond to medications. And so I would focus on their uh, comorbid conditions, as we say, helping to treat anxiety and so on in patients who have uh, uh, social uh, behavior challenges. And so the two patients that the, that the chapter discusses are people who live on opposite extremes of the social spectrum. One who was on the autism spectrum, uh, this was uh, uh, Charles who, uh, although he was able to speak uh, as, as some with autism can't, but he was able to, to speak effectively, but he had very significant uh, social deficits and couldn't make eye contact. Was, uh, it clearly was something very aversive to him to, to look in the eyes of another person which we often see in, in autism. And then at the other extreme, uh, a very, very uh, hyper uh, social individual who uh, uh, formed instant connections, used you know, rich and complex imagery effortlessly uh, and, and, and seemed to connect all, all phases, all streams of, of information together into a, a, a beautiful tapestry that just, just flowed out uh, effortlessly. And I, I, in my own way, I was in, you know, amazed by both of these patients, but all I was seeing these patients at the same time as we were studying, you know, with optogenetics, uh, social interaction in, in, in mice. And, and so it was really, I tried to reflect some of the uh, amazing, you know, feelings that get stirred by that when you see patients who are expressing these uh, really, you know, often debilitating, but also quite quite interesting states, and then to be able to go and test things directly in in the animals that are inspired and guided by uh, what we see in the patients. And so that was, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you about the neuroscience. And actually, of course, you know, uh, Catherine, your work is, I think, probably the, the the best example, and for the for the social interaction and the use of optogenetics to study uh, social behavior. We had, uh, I was inspired by your work showing that the 
mammalian state of parenting, this quintessential mammalian state that is <laughs> so fundamental to the experience of, of humanity uh, and also of, of you know, mammals in, in, in general is it can be uh, studied in a rigorous way, uh, in a way that uh, identifies its component parts and how those parts are unified into the whole. And you did, uh, you and your colleagues in the lab did some amazing experiments showing that the in complex state of parenting could be uh, uh, broken down into uh, particular connections that uh, guide going to, to, to find the young, to retrieve the young, bring them back to the nest, and then other projections that govern the actual care, the grooming, and so on. And that was just a beautiful illustration of, of how we could identify how the parts give rise to the whole and how these uh, complex states really are, are tractable, that we can speak about them with precision, that we can identify components that matter, that are causal. And that was that's certainly part of the overall picture, but we were doing, uh, you know, also in, in my lab, some experiments on social behavior as well. And we found that we could uh, tune the relative uh, balance of activity of excitatory cells and inhibitory cells, cells that are actively stimulating other neurons and cells that are actively inhibiting other neurons. And it had been hypothesized that this balance between these two kinds of cells might be important in, in autism because uh, a number of bits of evidence, including the fact that many patients with autism are susceptible to, to seizures and epilepsy. And, and so what we had found was that there was this uh, over excitation that could be studied in the laboratory as well. When we took mice and we made their excitatory cells um, uh, advantage compared to the inhibitory cells, we actually saw profound social behavior deficits that were caused and they could be corrected by flipping that balance back around. And as all this was happening, you know, I had this patient, this, this very nice young gentleman, uh, Charles, and I was able to talk to him and I was able to ask him about very specific symptoms that he had, including this eye contact thing, which is really striking. Many people who have friends or family who, 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 who are on the autism spectrum will know very well uh, this, this very interesting symptom where eye contact is almost seems uh, like it's avoided. Uh, and when eye contact is made, it's very brief and fleeting, and then the, the, uh, it, it's terminated very quickly by the, uh, the, the person. And so I was able to ask my patient about this while all this was going on. And this, you know, I, I tried to reflect in the, in the book how what a, 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 what a privileged moment this, 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 this really is to be able to be studying things in the lab and to talk to other human beings about their experience in ways that were directly connected. And he reflected to me that uh, the reason he was looking away, the reason eye contact was difficult for him, it was not fear, it wasn't anxiety, it was that the information was overwhelming, that there was too much content, too much data coming in, too much information, and it was it overwhelmed him. He had to think about what he would have to do if I did one thing or another thing, and he knew that he wasn't able to keep up. He knew he wasn't going to, and he knew that would be a problem, and so he, he was looking away for that reason. And the reason that was such a transcendent moment is I could, this mapped directly onto what we were looking at in the laboratory, and uh, we could actually quantify, even in bits per second, that under the conditions where this excitation uh, and inhibition imbalance uh, existed, that there was a real deficit in information processing in bits per second, and that we could actually quantify this, this, uh, this overwhelmed uh, quantity in the circuitry. So this was, this is a, a, an answer, you know, to your question, trying to, to capture this, the, the feeling of, of the physician scientist who's able to talk to patients and get these nearly inarticulable uh, states uh, uh, expressed as best as the patient can. And then, and, and to, for modern neuroscience, including optogenetics to help uh, with the understanding. And that, that was the, the, the conveying that, that excitement and that and that the hope for the future in, in helping uh, the patients was was a big uh, uh, part of that that chapter. Yeah. So there's another uh, chapter also on some essential needs, uh, hunger and thirst, that you described that I I found very striking. Uh, you talk about um, a patient who has uh, bulimia nervosa, and you also talk about several patients who have uh, anorexia, and uh, these. 
uh, bring you to some reflection about um, the control of hunger and thirst. And uh, these bring some of your own experiment in your lab on, on the sense of thirst and how uh, on, on the one hand, uh, you can stimulate uh, a very specific population of neurons and have uh, a, a very, um, very specific behavior being engaged. And on the other hand, there are also other areas of the brain uh, that uh, are, are maybe uh, controlling this and, and the interaction between both uh, make you uh, think and, and discuss what free will could be. Uh, tell, tell me more about this. I think this is both philosophical and, uh, and, and completely to the core of what neuroscience is, is trying to understand or the limit of neuroscience. Yeah, no, these, these questions get really to the heart of, of what the, the self is and uh, how it can go wrong, the, how the, the self can, in some cases, become fragmented or can become almost too powerful. And the eating disorders, anorexia and bulimia are, you know, first of all, uh, you know, I, I spent many months on a, uh, as, a, as a physician on a, a pediatric uh, inpatient uh, psychiatry ward, which is mostly... Uh, you know, in large part occupied by anorexia patients. And this is so heartbreaking that these, uh, these um, you know, children are uh, suffering in this way that they, they won't, they refuse to eat and they, they become extremely ill and, and can die from this. And it's, a, I would, there's, you know, psychiatry is full of mysteries um, and there's none more terrible and mysterious than, than eating disorders. And if you think about, you know, what is the, what is really going on here um, and how can we study this? The first question is, well, let's think about uh, how we regulate feeding, how we, when we're hungry or thirsty, uh, which cells are governing the appropriate response, the intake of food or water. And optogenetics has been really helpful for that. There, there were uh, there are cells in the hypothalamus and the extended hypothalamus that have been identified that indeed are not just correlated with, but in real time control, the active intake of food uh, or water when hungry or thirsty, and that even govern the aversive state, the state of feeling bad of being uh, uh, thirsty, for example. It's not when we're thirsty, as we all know, it's, we don't just go and get water. We also feel bad until we go and get water. And that may seem like a, a subtle difference, but it actually is another part of the state. There's the going to get water and there's the feeling bad, and those are bound up together. Optogenetics has helped us identify the cells that, that govern those states, just as with your beautiful uh, parenting work. And so that's helped us understand the cells that, that control the behaviors. But what's interesting is, is in the eating disorders, the patients know it's not as if they don't know they're hungry. They, they know that there's an emptiness there. The patient who uh, has anorexia is, is not blind to the, the hunger. Uh, it's not as if the hunger cells are, are shut down and that's why they're no longer taking in the food. It's, that's clearly not the case. And you can understand this by, by talking to them. They know it's there, they know the hunger is there. What they've done is they've layered something else on top of that, that changes the response to hunger. And that's gotta be something very powerful considering how important the uh, primal drive uh, to eat and, and to drink are. And so this, this layering of something on, on top has the ability to uh, exert a dominant control over these, these primal drives is actually what's, what's going on in the eating disorders. And so in the, in, in the, in the, the chapter, there's, you know, I think some, some very, you know, I reflect on some of the heart rending, but in, in at least one case, a, a positive outcome that came from a, from a patient with an eating disorder, but also the, the link to neuroscience, modern neuroscience, uh, was was really helpful because what we were doing at about you know even as the book was being written uh, I was you know we were carrying out experiments in, in my laboratory including a wonderful work led by uh, Will Allen uh, uh, and along with Lee Chun Lo and these were experiments where we were carrying out a brain-wide recording with electrodes listening in on neurons all across the brain uh, while we were uh, making animals thirsty or, or not thirsty. And uh, 
and an animal that's thirsty will, will lick for, for water until it's no longer thirsty, and that's normal. And if you optogenetically stimulate the thirst neurons, you can make an animal that uh, was sated and no longer licking water to then start licking water again very vigorously as if it were very thirsty. And that's pretty interesting uh, by itself that helps you show which are the thirst neurons and you can then map which are the cells they connect to and all this other interesting uh, neuroscience. But we noticed a, a very interesting thing, and this is reflected in the, the, the paper that we published. When we just stimulated the thirst neurons and we recorded all across the brain to see what all the rest of the brain was doing, almost all parts of the brain, you could tell it looked as if the animal were thirsty. This is an animal that had been thirsty, uh, had gotten a lot of water and was no longer thirsty, no longer looking for water. And then we stimulated the thirst neurons. And not only was the animal behaving as if it were thirsty, looking for more water, but almost all across the brain, all the other neurons looked like they were in the thirst mode. And they, it was, it was clearly the, the most of the brain was fooled and thinking that the animal was thirsty, but some parts were not completely fooled. And this was the very interesting thing. There were some areas in the uh, higher cortical areas, an area called retrosplenial cortex and an area in the uh, prefrontal cortex that clearly were affected, but were not completely fooled. If you looked at them, you could, it didn't quite, it wasn't quite the thirst state, it was something else. And, and there was a part in the very recently evolved part of the brain that, that stood apart and was able to uh, resist the instructions, if you will, resist the influence coming from the thirst neurons. And this I thought was, was very important because this tells us there are parts of the brain that can stand apart, can resist the primal drives and we can identify them. And this, even drives as, as fundamental as hunger and thirst. And, and these are structures and cells and connections that may underlie the ability of the patients with anorexia and bulimia to overcome and alter these, these primal drives. And so it was another, you know, at, at the same time as, as you know, heart-rending clinical cases are going on, we have the promise and the hope from neuroscience for understanding at least. Yeah. So, you know, the, the cases we discuss, social behavior, uh, hunger, thirst, uh, I think are kind of easy to uh, model or relatively simpler to, to model an animal. But they are, you mentioned other cases that are way, way more difficult. Um, for example, you talk about Henry, uh, who has borderline personality disorder. And what uh, is interesting here is that when you talk to him, you actually become angry at him because, because he's manipulating you, because there's something in him that obviously is going a wire and you're trying to help him, but you're becoming upset. And tell us about this and tell us here, is neuroscience also gonna help you here? Yeah, so you've picked up on the fact that there are a couple cases where neuroscience still has a ways to go and borderline personality is one of them. Um, this is, and not all the, the chapters, you know, show a path toward, toward understanding or resolution by the science. Some of them are, are just our are, are human stories and saying what's known, what is known about the science, but, but really it just, just helping people connect with and understand what this human condition is. And Borderline is, is one of those, it's, it rivals the eating disorders in terms of how hard it is to understand and, and relate to in the, in, in the typical human experience. Um, and the story that, that, is, is, that I, I tell here is about, it, it's, the psychiatrists uh, you know, will, will recognize this uh, and it's an important thing to, to share. When we feel an emotion that's stirred by a patient, um, it's important to recognize it, and it's important to realize that that is likely also something that other people in the lives of the patient will have experienced too. And that is very helpful because you can use that to help the patient. You can say, okay, if I'm feeling this, <laughs> I shouldn't, even if it's even if it's something like anger, even if it's making me feel angry about the patient, I shouldn't deny it's there. I shouldn't, you know, uh, jam it down. And, and try to pretend I'm, I'm not feeling it. No, I, I should, I should notice that. Trained. You're getting trained for that too, I suppose, right? Or oh, it comes with experience. 
Uh, both, it certainly certainly comes from from training, but also the experience. And we recognize that it's there, and then we say, okay, I, I need to use this. This is if I recognize this and I help the patient with this, I, that that helps them. And so we try to do that with the patients with borderline. And in this case, this this patient, uh, I was able to come to a very deep and I think helpful connection in the end with the patient by recognizing that that anger. And there is a lot of interesting neuroscience that's likely relevant, but we have a long way to go in understanding this disorder. And I wanted to, to just share the story, bring everybody, the, the, the global community up to speed on, on what this is, how it's common, how it's um, as mysterious as it is, it's consistent, it's real, it's biological, and it's something that these are our, our brothers and sisters and, and friends and colleagues who are suffering. And it's, it's, as hard as it is to understand, it's it's real, and the, ner the neuroscience is starting to get us a little bit of the way toward understanding. Yeah. So, you know, we are running out of time, but to ask you my last question, which is also one of the questions that I see in the Q and A. So, what's next for 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 you for neuroscience for optogenetics? Uh, are you going to model? I, I know you're working with zebrafish, also you're working with mice. Are you going to start with to work with uh, non-human primates? Uh, are there any hope that techniques such as optogenetics might be convertible somehow to patient treatment? Optogenetics is is primarily a basic science discovery tool, and it's it's and, and wow, has it delivered on that? It's it's given us so many insights and continuing to give us insights. It has, uh, the, because with optogenetics, you deliver a gene, uh, it's not the simplest thing for direct clinical translation. Um, my colleague, Botan Roska in Switzerland has uh, very recently used optogenetics to confer uh, vision, again, light sensitivity, at least onto human beings who, who were blind. And so it, there will be cases, there already are cases where it's directly clinically useful, but much more significant is the understanding it's given us. And then any kind of treatment becomes more powerful. Nowhere do we know more that this important than in psychiatry where we just need understanding. But what we are doing now is we're doing clinical trials. So I'm, I'm in fact, just today, I came from the, the, the hospital where we're doing experiments um, uh, to understand better the human state of dissociation. This is where the self becomes fragmented and people don't are aware of physical experiences, but they don't attribute them to themselves. And so they don't care as much about them. And this is a clinically important state. It shows up in most people, more than 70% of people who have trauma. It's common in PTSD, it's common in borderline. So mysterious though, so poorly understood. But optogenetics has actually helped us understand this state more deeply. And what we're doing is going back and forth from the, the, the laboratory to the human clinical setting. We have patients who are undergoing normal clinical care, who have electrodes in their brain to find the source of seizures, we're in a court, normal course of treating these patients and giving them the best possible care. We're also gaining insights into the construction of the self, how it's bound together, and linking that back to things we can do in the laboratory uh, uh, more causally and directly using optogenetics. So that, I think, is the future is, is not even non-human primates, we're, we're going right to people and we're gaining, uh, you know, already uh, really uh, uh, amazing insights into these very fundamental and mysterious questions like, you know, the construction of the self and the unity of the self, which, you know, is more than I could have ever hoped for. But the amazing thing is it all comes from, from these beautiful little microbial uh, genes and that were first identified, you know, the, the, these light responses in algae were identified more than 150 years ago by a botanist. And, and so it's, it's bot botany that's helping us understand in some ways these, these most mysterious parts of ourselves. And I think that's just a great story in, in science and important for people to know. Yeah, so there's a, a question related to uh, what, you, what you've said a few minutes ago. Uh, is there a limit to understanding complex behaviors and phenomena of the mind and otherwise by breaking them down uh, akin to historical reductionism? How does this relate to the idea of emergent phenomena? So you're talking about studying various parts of the brain, bringing them together. H how does that work? How, how far can you go? Well, if you completely disassemble a system, of course, you lose you lose something very important. If you if you have a sentence and you take all the words apart, they lose all their meaning. It's it's only by being together in the sentence that they matter. It's the same 
with the brain, we can't speak too much about any one part in isolation. And that's in many ways, the beauty of optogenetics is you can work with the precision of individual kinds of cells or even individual cells while they're all still within the fully intact functioning uh, brain. And so there, we're, it's, a, it's a different kind of, of reductionism. You're not actually reducing the system. The system stays intact, uh, but you're uh, increasing the precision with which your, your intervention occurs. And that has been uh, remarkably informative. We've done experiments where we can play in, deliver, input the activity of dozens of individually specified cells into the visual cortex, the part of the brain that processes uh, visual input uh, first and, and most directly. And we can uh, cause uh, a mouse to, to behave and also for its brain to behave just as if it's seeing something that isn't really there, uh, just by playing in the precise patterns of cells that correspond to what naturally happened when the stimulus, visual stimulus was actually there. Both the animal's behavior and that internal representation which psychologists have sought to understand for so long. What is the internal representation of the, the external world? We can now see it and provide it. And the rest of the, the region of the brain and the animal's behavior are correspond to what happens naturally. And so the, there does not, you know, we, we have not encountered a, a limit on, on what we can uh, do uh, in principle with, with, with optogenetics, we can provide uh, patterns of activity, and we can elicit naturalistic internal representations and behavior. And so, we're, we're the, the promise of keeping the system intact while increasing the, the resolution with which one can uh, access the individual parts. I think uh, is is uh, still has a, a long way to go, and and many things to to be discovered using this approach. So there's a question about emotions. Which are the basic emotions, and do they each arise in distinct bottom-up circuits? or the top-down interpretation of arousal, calm, pleasure, and pain? Yeah, this is a, this is a, a very deep question. Uh, and again, it comes, you have to, of course, uh, um, first uh, accept that there is not a single spot in the brain that, that governs emotions. There's not a single spot in the brain that governs actions. We often do use words like top down and bottom up in, in neuroscience. Uh, they're, they're convenient words, but, but uh, we, we uh, are increasingly realizing that choices and actions and feelings and sensations really are distributed everywhere and represented uh, everywhere in the brain. Uh, why that's the case is, is another question, but it's certainly the case that they're all over. And emotion related decisions can be affected by the activity of neurons all over the brain recently evolved parts of the brain like neocortex, uh, um, uh, areas that we share with fish that are, 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 are deeper and older. These uh, all can reflect affective or emotional states and, and cause them to happen. So, you know, this is, this is the first answer is that uh, emotion is really everywhere. Affective responses are, are really everywhere. You know, the basic emotions, when you ask about that, when you say, what's a basic emotion? Well, we have, you know, we have fear, we have uh, defensiveness uh, in terms of uh, uh, trying to defend oneself. There's aggression and anger. There are, there are other seemingly fundamental emotions. We can reflect these. We can see these happening even in our most ancient vertebrate cousins. Uh, in fish, we can see uh, uh, behaviors that correspond to this uh, and we can study them and we can see amazing commonalities The we are, as you mentioned, Catherine, we're doing work in zebrafish and we find that the same basic structures that fish use to express these emotional state changes, the same things are those that are relevant in, 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 in mammals as well. So emotions are, are ancient, ancestral and conserved uh, and they're really uh, represented in a, in a very distributed way across the brain. Yeah, actually, I, uh, it is a part, it are many parts of your books that uh, we've not been able to discuss, but uh, you talk a lot about um, emotions and the evolution of emotions. And obviously, uh, emotions cannot be found in fossils. So, you know, it's up to our imagination also. Uh, but you describe tears as something that is uniquely humans. And you say tears are very important for psychiatrists. So, 
tell me about this. How, tears. Did, how did tears appear? Why do we cry? Not tears, I should say, crying. Well, that, and that is an important distinction. Uh, there are, it's very clear that other uh, mammals, for example, express grief and, and mourn and uh, even uh, uh, have facial expressions that in many cases may make us think uh, of, of uh, grief or, or mourning. Uh, but what's very interesting is that emotional tears, the, the, you know, the, the, the drops coming from our, our tear ducts, this appears to be a human uh, trait. Even our, our great ape cousins don't uh, seem to shed emotional tears per se. And not only are we pretty special in that regard, but also you can quantify the effect of, of tears. Uh, people studying human beings have uh, digitally altered the uh, presence of tears on images of human faces, and tears are much more powerful at stirring emotions and in observers, including the impulse to help, than any other facial expression, including any other kind of grimace. And so that's one interesting thing. That's a that's a fact. Um, and better the other... language, then. So that's interesting. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, and and they're although they're not completely involuntary, they are largely involuntary. We all know that tears have come when we haven't uh, wanted them to come. And, and so it's a, it, to some extent, it's like a truth channel. It's a, it's a, it's a channel reflecting information that is uh, not entirely under our control, not so easily gamed or, or faked. Um, and we know that it has a, a the, the most powerful impact of any other facial feature on others' impulse to help. And so it raises this interesting evolutionary question, is there value for a, a truth channel that is that conveys what is a, a ground truth that cannot be so easily gamed? And for social organisms like us and organisms that live in communities that build, that help each other build, that, that devote immense energy to helping each other uh, and need to have some access to, to, to ground truth, it actually makes sense for a co-evolved expression of what is really true and deep and the response to that uh, of the, the impulse to help. And so there's a the story uh, that is reflected there. There's a, there was a, a patient who, who couldn't cry. Uh, he had a, I won't go into the details of what, what happened to the patient, but it was a, 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 a very terrible tragedy. And he was somebody who had been able to cry before, but with this tragedy, he couldn't. He, he was experiencing grief, but he couldn't cry. And so that ability had been deleted from the, the, the complex state. And what I was able to, to find in this patient was that the unique thing about what had happened to him was that there was no hope anymore for this patient. He had, not only was the tragedy terrible, but the, the nature of it was such that he had no further hope. And, and that raises the, 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 you know, the, the sad and tragic, but also interesting uh, question are, are of if, if there is, is no hope, it's, it's, it's probably not worth to, the trouble of, of tears is, is no longer worth it. And so this, this is something that we, we can link to anatomy, to behavior. Uh, you know, we think about the projections that come from emotional areas of the brain down to the brainstem where the, the lacrimal gland uh, nerves are originate, the seventh nerve nucleus. And we think how close that seventh nerve nucleus is that governs tears normally to other parts of the brain that govern emotional breathing and a very small redirection of just a few little connections, a few little projections across the brain could have turned a, an emotional state into one that carries a largely uncontrollable expression of, of, of tears that serves as a, as a truth channel, a social communication truth channel. It'd be interesting to identify what sorts of channels like that may be present in other organisms. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's very interesting. Um, a question from uh, someone in the audience: uh, When you identify brain nucleus that controls the symptom of interest using optogenetics, how is that knowledge eventually going to be translated for new psychiatric treatment? Can you give a potential prediction of a treatment development in psychiatry from your own finding in mice? So this actually. Uh... That the question of uh, what's the direct link uh, to treatment comes up all the time because I'm, I'm seeing patients in the clinic and uh, these are patients where we don't have all the treatments that we'd like and yet we have these amazing insights that are coming from the laboratory 
And, and so what is the fastest way that we could get these insights to help the, the patients? And we're working on that. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, optogenetics is already helping you know, blind people see again, which uh, is, is amazing, but it doesn't have to be a direct application of optogenetics. The great thing about this technology is we, once you know what matters, once you know which cells matter, then any treatment that addresses those cells, that targets those cells can become very powerful. And uh, great examples of this include this dissociation question that I mentioned before. So this is a very debilitating symptom. Uh, it shows up in all across psychiatry and normal human experience. We were able to identify cells using optogenetics and other methods that cause dissociation and particular activity patterns that, that cause them. And now knowing those cells, we can dive into those cells in great detail and understand them much better, see which genes they express, which proteins they make, which sort of tags or, or, or roots into those cells might be available on, on the molecular level. And we're doing this and now we can say, okay, here's a unique uh, protein or set of proteins in these cells. Let's now design a medication strategy that targets those cells armed with this causal knowledge and this precise knowledge that's immensely useful in helping us to develop new kinds of treatment. And so that's, I think, even the most important clinical outcome of, of optogenetics is making any kind of treatment more, more potent. Wonderful. Uh, there's a last question that is an educational question. Uh, what is your advice for young people interested to get into neuroscience? How should they go about finding the most important questions? So this is something that uh, I get asked a lot and I'm always wary to try to not be too definitive. I, I don't wanna seem as though um, I have any answers at all. Uh, that could be the worst possible thing for me to <laughs> tell people, here's how I think you should, you should do it. Uh, and so I'm not doing that, but I will, I will say that, you know, the world is, is complex and life is short and you should study what is most beautiful to you, most, most interesting, uh, that's, that, that strikes a chord with you, that will make you uh, think about it all the time, go to sleep thinking about it, wake up thinking about it, just because you love it, because it's amazing to you and matters to you. And, and so that's the first thing I would say. And then the only other thing I would add to that is that, uh, you know, there, try, try to have a mix of things that are seem hard and seem easy, um, but also be aware that, that you could uh, be wrong about which is hard and which is easy. Um, and this happens all the time. Sometimes in, in science, the, the things we think are the hardest are the ones that, that work first and the other way around. So I would, I would just say, you know, you, you can't predict. So have a few things going on, you know, try, try a few things, have a few projects, try to see things in a new way, but above all, you know, just, just follow the beauty. On this, thank you so much, Carl. Uh, congratulations for this beautiful book. And uh, actually, will there be another book? I'm sure you have a lot of stories uh, in your memory and way more to say. You know, I, I, I do, but this was, for me, this was such, uh, so I, I, someday, yes, uh, this, this was such a big, uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> this was a big undertaking for me though. This is more than 20 years of, of thinking and writing and, and medicine and science and imagination. And, and so I, I may just, just take a little breather for a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Thank Wonderful. you. Thank you so much, Catherine and Carl for this fascinating conversation. And thanks to all of you out there watching and spending your evening with us. Please learn more about this remarkable book and purchase copies of projections at harvard.com. I reposted the link in the chat. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science and the Harvard Library, please have a good night. Keep reading and stay safe and well. And thanks again to both of you. Thanks, Thank you. everyone. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Thank you.